Dr. Wong Tek Wee, a seasoned interventional cardiologist and physician, boasts an extensive medical background with qualifications from prestigious institutions worldwide. Formerly a consultant cardiologist at Hospital Serdang and an associate professor of medicine at UPM, he now practices at iHeal Medical Center. Dr. Wong's expertise lies in early de disease detection and prevention, focusing on lifestyle management, heart failure, geriatric cardiology, interventional cardiology, and cardiac imaging. He advocates for therapeutic plant-based diet, especially among the elderly and patients with chronic diseases. Dr. Wong has contributed significantly to medical research, participated in multinational clinical trials, and lectured at various conferences. His holistic approach to patient care includes complementary therapies alongside conventional medical interventions. We now invite Dr. Wong to deliver the Dharma talk this morning. Good morning. I live in Bandar Utama and I have not come to this uh, center for a long, long time. So <laughs> I hope that I can uh, give you some information that can help you. Okay, before we start, I want you to do an exercise. So can you raise two of your hands? Two of your hands? Okay. So with your dominant arm, keep the dominant arm up. The other one, you can put it down. So one hand up. Okay. So this exercise, I want you to take a deep breath, the biggest breath that you have, and then hold it until you cannot tahan. You hold it longer with your mental strength. Also, you physically hold it, and when you cannot tahan, use your mental strength to tahan further. When you cannot tahan, you can put your hand down, okay? So we start now. Just keep your hand up and hold the one breath. So hold it with your physical strength. And when you cannot hold it, use your mental strength to hold further. And when you cannot hold this one breath, you put your hands down. Okay, so you can see some of you here can still hold your hands up. Uh, there are a few reasons. Some reason is that they cannot understand my instruction, they continue to, to breathe. <laughs> There's once I was doing it, some of them can hold for five minutes. <laughs> Not possible. <laughs> so, some of you here, I think four or five of you, must be diver or marathon or super meditator. You can hold your breath for so long. <laughs> okay. So maybe I uh, talk about my conflict of interest. I, when I was young in the uni, I particip participated in the Easter camp, and also I attended some of these uh, Tibetan uh, classes, and also done all this Tara Mantra and Fire Puja. And I'm the, currently a president of Susima Meditation Society under uh, Bante Kovido, and I attended many talks at uh, Babs and also meditation retreat with Sayale Susila. And my sons used to attend the Sunday classes here many years ago. And current, uh, my youngest son attended the secondary school at the City of 10,000 Buddha in the US, founded by Master Shenhua. And currently, I'm a certified commissioner and a Tima volunteer for Tsuji. So I have exposure to all these um, different traditions, but superficial uh, level, so it's not in-depth. In 2024, at the World Economic Forum, so they survey some of these uh, leaders and they ask them what is the global risk in 2024. And a lot of them say that uh, it's extreme weather, uh, misinformation, societal or political polarization, cost of living crisis, cyber attacks. So a few of them is IT, but the main one is the weather changes. 
And I want to suggest that uh, Buddhism is a solution for the global risk. And the survey also asked, within two years, what is the main thing that, uh, that, that has the, the threat? So for the first two years, uh, it's a misinformation, all this AI and all that. Second is uh, extreme weather, societal polarization, the war, uh, cyber insecurity, interstate conflicts so of war, and also AI. But in 10 years' time, four of them are from the weather and also environment. Extreme weather events, critical change to the Earth system, biodiversity loss, natural resource shortages, and followed by misinformation and disinformation and all this AI thing. And these are the societal, uh, political, geopolitical uh, changes. So Buddhism is a very proactive and non-fatalistic fatalistic scientific practice. A lot of them, a lot of time you say uh, Buddhists will meditate and just uh, doesn't care about the rest in the world. So I want to suggest to you, there's a, this 12 links of dependent origination, and uh, the first three, it explained that our ignorance created mental formation. And uh, the mental formation created the consciousness. So a lot of times, we think that whatever that we have now is our karmic forces. Um, but these 12 dependent originations say that it's not just our karmic forces, whatever that we are enduring now or suffering now. It's also our volitional action. So our volitional action, because our mind changed very fast, and whatever that you experience now, of course, is your karmic disposition from your past ignorance and also uh, things that happened in the past. But whatever you do now, you change the future. The future could be one second later. So, um, so Buddhism is a very proactive uh, practice where your volitional action can change the path. Uh, it's not whatever that happened to you. So the future depends on just not just on the karmic. Uh, this position is also our volitional action. So I also want to uh, share the similarities between the, all the Buddhism practice and uh, just quickly summarize it. Acceptance of Shakyamuni Buddha as an original teacher, rejection of a supreme creator compared to Buddhism and uh, compared to Christianity and, uh, and Muslim. Rejection of an eternal soul, unchanging soul, the soul keeps changing. So these are the things that you already know, four number two, eight four path, dependent origination that I talk about, and acceptance of karma. But I want to highlight uh, certain things that is important in this uh, talk today. Belief in rebirth, influenced by our action and also karma. So we will uh, continue to be uh, recycled, life after life. So if you are Buddhist, you are uh, supposed to believe all this. And uh, the final thing is that Nirvana is the ultimate goal. So in this uh, talk, the key principle is the dependent origination is in our hand. And also we are going uh, assemble of karma and also believe in a rebirth. It means that we are continue to come back to this world if you are not taking care of the world. So, and uh, this one comes from uh, the AI Nobu. Uh, I think one of you here in Babswa are the, the founder of this uh, AI called Nobu. And, and one of the things that there is a similarity of all these uh, major regions is uh, compassion and altruism. Uh, it's one of the Brahma Vihara, compassion, the love. Of, uh, of all the different sentient beings and of our environment. So I also want to highlight some of these uh, changes. This is tsunami in Aceh. So you can see that in Aceh, when the tsunami come, all these buildings around the, the, the masjid was destroyed by tsunami. Only the masjid stay strong. So you may say that this is only structure that's made from uh, concrete. It's not true. Some, some of the richer inhabitants also have uh, concrete houses. But how come only this masjid stay on? And, and in uh, Australia, where this is one of the, one of the Theravada Center, where this uh, forest fire, the bushfire was burning everywhere except this uh, center. Uh, in the city of 10,000 Buddha, it's uh, located in uh, California, where my son studied for a few years. Uh, they have yearly uh, forest fire, but it never uh, encroached near to, to, the, to the Buddhist center. So you can see that this, uh, some of the changes uh, with spiritual practice that also 
protected their spiritual place. So uh, it shows that our mind is so strong. So Mother Earth is sick and angry, and we know the principle of balance. So our Chinese uh, yin and yang must be balanced. Not too much, not too little. And if you remove the life force, so in Buddha thought about the four elements, air, water, uh, soil, heat. If you remove this, you remove uh, plant, and you remove, because the plant is the one that sustains uh, human's health and all the health of all the uh, creatures on earth. And we are at the top of the food chain. We are the apex predator. So can we survive? So we can see that all these four elements, if the earth is not stable, it causes a landslide. Too much air, it causes typhoon. Too much of fire, it causes uh, all this um, forest fire. Too much water, it causes flood. So the imbalance of the four elements of nature will cause uh, disaster. So why is there imbalances? These are some of the studies that have shown that if our earth temperature increase more than 1.5 degrees, is the tipping point for earth survival. So when it's one degree Celsius, at the moment we are about one degree Celsius from the baseline uh, since 1950s. So it has been stable for millions of years and from 1950s onward it started to climb. So that's why we are suffering from all this uh, earth disaster. When it's two degrees Celsius, over one million species will face extinction. Three degrees Celsius, all the icebergs will melt, leading to massive climate refugees. Four degrees uh, Celsius will cause 40% uh, of the inhabited land will be covered. Sea level will rise for three to six minutes, as three to six feet. And uh, five to six degrees Celsius, most of the living creatures will extinct. There's a point of no return. So you can look at this, and I want you to memorize a few numbers. When the, these are the years, and these are the carbon dioxide uh, level. So you can see that at the moment, in 2020, our carbon dioxide level is about 450. And if we continue whatever we are doing now, it will rise, 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 rise to 1,200 in 2050, if we don't change anything from now on. So, and then it says here, if you, if you stop whatever we are doing now, it can actually reduce, but reduce at a very, very long time. It takes 1,000 years to reduce a little bit. Uh, so depending where we are, at the moment we are here. So if you're not going to do anything, it will continue to grow. So these are some of the studies and uh, global average temperature. Just now I talked about uh, the last uh, 2,000 years, you can see the temperature has been remained stable. And then there was a, a little ice age, around 1,400 to 1,800. The temperature actually uh, dipped down. But at this point, somewhere in, uh, in 1780, which is uh, the starting of the Industrial Revolution, the, the temperature start to rise. So this is the baseline that we look at. And uh, at the moment, we are about 1 degree Celsius. And I said that 1.5 degrees Celsius is the, is the tipping point. And if you look at some of these studies from all the ice core, they, they dig out all the, uh, no, sorry, this is from the NASA and some of the research thing, and found that our temperature has increased one degree Celsius from the baseline of 1950s. And then uh, if you have not heard of this, you can Google about this climate clock. Climate clock talks about uh, the, how much time that we have left before the, the tipping point. So there's a timeline of, that most government is unwilling to commit. And uh, we also mustn't pretend that we have more time than we do. So this you can Google on your own. And this is the uh, last time that I assessed this is uh, 30th of uh, December. It showed that if we continue with whatever we are doing now, we have only five years. So five years and 204 days. So that means that in 2030, we will achieve the point of no return, where the temperature has increased 1.5 degrees from pre-industrial period. So it's not very long. So now we are feeling very comfortable, our temperature is good, and uh, no major disaster. But if you don't change, uh, all of us will suffer together. And so the climate clock has this deadline, six years left. They also have life nine. means that uh, the government commit money to, to, to change from uh, whatever we are doing to renewable energy transition. And also the, this is the carbon budget countdown. So there's a, too much carbon. There's also 
uh, change to a renewable energy like like uh, solar wind, hydro, and uh, geothermal change. But these are the from the initiative from the government, which is uh, limited. Oh. So, what is the reason for our environmental changes? Uh, the biggest one is a uh, is a uh, gas emission, carbon dioxide and methane. So, some of you uh, heard about this, but today I'm going to talk about in depth why some of these uh, gas are so dangerous. Deforestation, 20% pollution, overpopulation, uh, resource, but the main one is the greenhouse uh, gas emission. So for the last, last 1,000 years, our temperature has remained stable. The blue one is a carbon dioxide. You can see that carbon dioxide has remained stable at 275 for the last uh, 1,000 years. But from the Industrial Revolution onwards, it has increased to around 400 now. So it increased uh, along 70 or 80 percent in the last 200 years. So for million and billion of years, the, the carbon dioxide has remained stable, but human has, uh, because of industrial revolution, has increased carbon dioxide in the, such a short time in 200 years. So for last 10,000 years, you can see uh, these are from the ice core from the from all these different uh, study, and they found that. Uh, the, the, the carbon dioxide has remained very stable at 270, and for the last 200 years, it shot up so much. So if you look at this, you'll be very alarmed because the temperature has gone up uh, a lot. I mean, carbon dioxide has gone up a lot. So this is, a, a, I think, is a very important uh, slide that uh, gives us a perspective of where we are. So the age of our Earth is about 4.5 billion years. But this graph is 60 million years. So 4.5 billion is like 4.5 thousand million years. Now, so this is nothing, uh, 60 million years. Compared to the existence of human, the first uh, bipedal human was found 18 million years. And then uh, I remember when I was in medical school, I learned about this Australopithecus in found, uh, first found in uh, Africa they only appear 3.5 million years only. And then uh, slowly progress to Homo habilis and Homo erectus near Dento. So the modern human only appeared 25,000 years ago. So you see this modern human uh, is so powerful, uh, they can change the world. And if you look at this, the, 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 the carbon dioxide level uh, for, for the last 10 million years, it remained around 200 plus. And then uh, suddenly, in uh, 200 years ago, it shot up so much. And you can also make, make question, how come in this uh, 10 to 16 million years, there are also higher uh, concentration of carbon dioxide? Uh, so if it's too little, also not good, but too much also can cause uh, ice age. So this, you have to find out yourself uh, why carbon dioxide higher. It causes global warming, and also it can cause um, uh, also, uh, too much of uh, ice. So, what are the killer gases? The killer gases. The first one is carbon dioxide. It con contributes about 75 percent. Methane is 16 uh, percent. Where does it come from? Carbon dioxide comes from burning fossil, deforestation, the land, the use of land. Methane is livestock rice paddies. So, rice paddies. Uh, why is rice paddy causing methane? Uh, because of uh, anaerobic uh, fermentation. So, anything that you ferment without oxygen, you commit, uh, will create uh, methane. So uh, landfills, natural gas processing, nitric oxide and fluorinated gas. These are some of the things that you use, you, you use a spray. But the key one is a carbon dioxide and uh, methane. So I want you to focus on these two. And uh, you can see that carbon dioxide, methane and nitric oxide. You see carbon dioxide for the last 200 years shot up, methane also shot up, and nitric oxide also shot up. But the strong one is a carbon dioxide and also methane. And the cutoff that I want you to look at is 400. So carbon dioxide is like uh, wearing a coat. It traps uh, uh, carbon dioxide, and it shows that humans has increased carbon dioxide 50% since the uh, uh, pre-industrial period. So, uh, and it makes our coat thicker, and our climate is uh, warming very quickly. So these are some of the small print, which I, I won't uh, go deeper, but it says that carbon dioxide is important, methane is important. And uh, this is uh, also 
uh, research and shows that global uh, warming potential. And it shows that one tonne of gas will absorb about a given period of time, it will absorb one tonne of carbon dioxide. And if carbon dioxide is used as a reference, it's given a GWP of one. So compared to carbon dioxide, methane has a GWP of 28 to 36. So it has the uh, ability to warm uh, about 26 times over 100 years. But the problem is the methane has a very short half-life. You know, the lifespan is about, uh, I don't know, I think maybe shorter. But if you look at 20, over 20 years, which is the life, lifespan of a methane, so it has this power of 84 times. So methane is 84 times. It's not one time, you know, one time is double, huh? this is 84 times. So methane is more powerful than carbon dioxide as a global uh, warming potential. So you can see here, over 100 years is 34, but because methane is a short half-life, so it takes 36 times. And, and uh, why is it important? So you can see that this methane, where does it come from? Anything that is uh, fermented anaerobically, so rice paddies, all the uh, area with a lot of uh, under oxygen, be, be, below the oxygen, will cause, um, will cause this. And then landfills. If you send your organic material to the garbage truck and they will send to landfills, it creates a lot of methane. And they also come from all this uh, uh, seabed and, and from the digestive uh, process in the animals. So all these are production of methane. And I want to highlight in US the key uh, production of, um, of methane come from these two, natural gas production. So when they produce uh, natural gas, some of these uh, byproducts that has been released to the, to, the, to the atmosphere. So natural gas is 30%. This one is, uh, is the uh, animals that, that are ruminant. So when they, they process it in their stomach, that will create a lot of methane. So what are the animals that create this? First one is uh, buffalo and beef. It produce, uh, the methane is produced for their per gram of protein is so much. Uh, this, these are the methane that they produce. So uh, it comes from their fat and also comes from their belch. So majority come from their belch because of the microbes in their stomachs. So there are four stomachs. So they break down all this uh, fiber that they, they eat and uh, the, the fermentation of all this uh, grass and uh, organic fiber will create gas, and these gas are methane. And because it's nearer to the mouth, so they, they, they burp it out uh, more than they pass it out in their motion. So the four stomach, so we call them ruminants. And uh, these are the four gut fermentation causing, uh, they produce the curd and, and they keep regurgitate and chew again and, and process again. So there are about 200 species of ruminants um, but the, ma the main one that uh, we're going to talk about is uh, the one that, uh, that produces a lot of methane. The first one is uh, cow, second is uh, sheep, and, and uh, some produced by all these other animals, but the main one is these two. So the world population versus the livestock, you can see 1.5 1 billion of cows, 1.1 billion of sheep, and 8 billion of humans, and 33 billion of uh, all these uh, chicken. So these are the common uh, meat that we, we take. So uh, this, you look at this. So the cattle uh, produce 120 kilograms of methane, uh, sheep, and uh, you, may, you may be surprised. How come pigs produce so little? Because they are not ruminants. Or they don't keep in their stomach and regurgitate and chew again. Humans also produce some. So sometimes uh, you eat uh, durian and all that, uh, you produce a lot of methane. So that's why, that's why uh, humans also can produce, but in a smaller amount. Look at that, 0 0.12 kilogram compared to 120 kilogram. So if a cattle were a country, which country will rank uh, top in the greenhouse uh, gas emission? Number one is China. So, so America also always attack China, uh, and it's true they produce a lot of greenhouse gases. Second is America, so they are not, not, not too good. Either <laughs> no complain about this. But number three is uh, cattle. So uh, cattle is number three in producing greenhouse gases. 
and followed by India. So for a cow uh, emission to convert into oxygen, you need 143 trees for one cow. So imagine 1.5 billion of cows. You need to have more uh, trees. And it's, you see here, this is a study uh, from uh, 2019 from Malaysia Bank Negara, and it shows that uh, our Malaysia food security is in, in threat. So we import 30 to 40 percent of our rice, beef more than 70 percent, and uh, the value that we spend on all this cereal, coffee, feed store, vegetable, fish, and all that is so much. So no wonder our economy is going worse and worse uh, because <laughs> we are not taking care of our food security. It is because these are all essential that we cannot, we cannot uh, go without, no matter what. And you can, you can see here, some of these things that we are self-sufficient, these are all the things that we have to import. So the first one is uh, poultry meat, it's uh, neutral. Oh. Uh, tuna, crab, mackerel, coconut. Coconut, wow, Malaysia, Malaysia is a hot country, why do we have to import coconut? Rice also, cabbage, chili, and beef, and mango, and mutton. All this we produce ourselves, but these are, we have to import, so that's not very good. And if you look at Malaysia's uh, consumption of meat, the majority, 50%, is uh, poultry. Second is uh, beef. The richer Malaysian will consume some beef. 5.2 uh, was... Uh, 5.2 million of, uh, per capita consumption is 5.2 kilogram of pork and also sheep. So you can see that uh, chicken is a major thing that we, we consume. Okay, this slide is uh, very, very small. So but I want to highlight to you the number one uh, food that produces a lot of greenhouses is number one is beef. Second is lamb. Also to consistent with what we talk about, the fermentation. Number three is cheese. So you should cut down your cheese uh, because the milk cow also have to produce a lot of methane. Uh, the dairy, okay, and chocolate also the same. Coffee is, uh, is one of the top five, followed by prawns, palm oil. So all these uh, Western countries complain about palm oil, but actually they are the ones that produce more of these um, greenhouse gases compared to palm oil. Pork meat, poultry meat, and all the way down. Uh, some of this is uh, carbon uh, negative, like uh, nut trees. Because when you have trees, then you can cut down the, all these uh, greenhouse gases. So the top one is beef, lamb, and also uh, prawns and all that. So land clearing produce a lot of uh, environmental damage. So for the past one year, 10 years, every minute a forest equivalent to about 11 football fields are lost to land clearing for animal farming. And uh, a lot of them, 40% of this land are to produce greens to feed the animal, okay? So, uh, so this is one of the reasons for, for the use of land that has uh, worsened for the last 200 years. It has been stable for 200 years, but because of uh, industrial revolution. So industrial revolution means that instead of using our hand to produce, now we use machine. So it's a machine that has uh, uh, allowed us to live longer, uh, with a better quality of life, but you also create a lot of destruction. And uh, the current revolution now is an AI revolution, something that will change drastically the way that we live. So you can look at this, the global land use for food production, 71%. I want to, to memorize this. 71% of our land uh, area, surface area, are ocean. 30% 30, 30 is from the land. Out of this 30%, 71% is uh, habitable. The rest are very bare, like, like, like all this uh, desert and all that. And you can see that all this uh, land, 46% uh, used for agriculture, 40% for forest. Of all this for agriculture, 77% are used for livestock. And only 23% are used for uh, crops. And you can see that the calorie supply for energy, uh, only such a big portion here, only allow you to have 20% of them uh, uh, supply carry to the world population. 82% 82, 82 uh, from uh, plant-based food. So a lot of people are suffering in the whole world. And as Buddhists, we want to relieve other sentient beings suffering, right? So if you eat so much of this, and uh, the production is not enough for the rest of the world to eat, uh, that is not, not so good for our karma, right? So global protein supply, 37% from meat and dairy. So protein, uh, and you can get 63% from the plant base. 
So it shows that we need less land to produce calorie and protein for the world population. And the clean water consumption, you produce one kilogram of potato, 100 liters of water, one kilogram of rice, 4,000 liters of water, but you, one kilogram of cow's meat, you need so much of water. Water is also a resource that is uh, very limited. So after you have been listening to my talk, you may say, this is none of my business, I can afford all this, I also don't really care. So, so but remember that the 12 dependent origination, the interconnectedness and interdependence of all phenomena. So Buddhism is a very scientific um, religion or philosophy. Uh, it talks about this interconnectedness and interdependence. We are all uh, recycled uh, from all these elements uh, from eons, and uh, we are all uh, related. So that's why all our puja and all that talk about uh, relieving uh, other sentient beings, you know, your, your, your mother and all that. So uh, there's uh, this hierarchy of needs uh, talked about by this um, Maslow. It's a theory of human motivation. So just now, uh, if any of you are not convinced by my talk, so we, we look at this. As human, we have these uh, physiological needs, nutrition, water, air, sleep, and uh, security, and shelter. But once we achieve this, we need uh, some safety needs, security, stability, predictability, and uh, protection, freedom from fear, uh, law, and limits. So at the moment, uh, we have been threatened by this environmental change. This is going to affect you because of the environmental change, and uh, countries may go for war to, to get some of these resources. So further up, uh, talk about social, when you have all this secure, then social needs, giving and receiving affection. Oh, this is, this is uh, our Buddhism, uh, you know, our community here. Esteem needs, positive self-evaluation, dignity, achievement, you know, and finally, self-actualization. So all of this here, because uh, for us to be able to come to Bubs on Sunday we, and don't have to go to work, that means we have certain uh, ability, uh, we have financial uh, ability and also health to be able to sit here today. And uh, so we may be thinking that we are here, but some of this threat may affect us in future or even uh, our future uh, generation of children and also yourself, because if you're Buddhist, you come back to this world again uh, that you destroy. So, so what are the consequences? So the global warming causes uh, these greenhouse gases. The climate change can cause all this, and these are already happening, uh, but the one degree Celsius, melting of ice and glaciers. So all this will cause uh, sea level to rise. The ocean acidification, all the corals and shellfish are dying, and uh, biodiversity loss. So this ocean acidification means that when the ocean becomes more acid because of too much carbon dioxide, then all the corals and shellfish, they are calcium. So acid will dissolve calcium. That's why they are dying. Uh, so sometimes you can read that uh, in, in the barrier reef in uh, Australia, the corals are becoming white. It's because of ocean acidification. Biodiversity loss, uh, health impacts, so more infectious disease. So uh, COVID-19 is can be because uh, the source, if, if you're not talking about all this uh, uh, conspiracy theory, uh, it's because of, it comes from the animals. So when humans spend a lot of time with animals, some of this virus will jump to the human and mutate and become stronger. So uh, if, you, if all this uh, animal farming may expose the animal viruses to human. Agriculture disruption, water scarcity, less of water. But these are the things that will affect you. Economic consequences, even though you are very comfortable now, because of uh, damage to infrastructure, increased cost of adaptation, disaster recovery, and population displacement, war, resource conflicts, social unrest, because of all this climate change. So uh, the climate clock says that in 2030, if you don't change, um, all of us, we're going to suffer and all these resources will become less and we become less, uh, countries may go to war. So, this, uh, in the <coughs> World Economic Forum, uh, they also talk about what are the global concerns. And you can see that 
coronavirus was a concern last two years, but it could become less and less. So many of you are not wearing masks now, not, don't really care, <laughs> not scared. And then inflation is something very really serious going up. And uh, all this corruption and financial thing is remain stable. And uh, unemployment and, and all this poverty. Uh. So these are all these environmental uh, and also economic changes that is uh, affecting us. But inflation is rising. All these are concerns for the last two years. And if you look at the cooperation trends by all these uh, different, different countries, and you can see that peace and security is going lower and lower. So countries are uh, fighting, you know, like US and, uh, uh, and China, or they have this geopolitical thing. So this is going to affect us. And you may think that which is more important, all this war is more important or the uh, environment more important. So you, uh, you can see that. So uh, these are the amount of money that they have uh, committed in COP28. It is in uh, Arabic country, UAE. And they have committed 85 billion to, to improve uh, climate change. So these are money that have, they have decided to donate to improve climate change. 85 billion US dollar. A lot of money, right? Our 1NDB is 2.5 billion, right? It's nothing uh, compared to this. So a lot of money used for finance. And then, uh, but if you look at war, so the direct losses of uh, war uh, is the over 100 hours of invasion. It cost 7 billion to the Russian Federation. 7 billion, just over 100 hours. This are, they have done the study. But if you look at this, it takes about 411 billion just to build a country compared to 85 billion. So war costs more to any country or to, to the world. And why the war in Ukraine threatens our global food security? Because they produce a lot of wheat, barley, maize, rapeseed, and also uh, some of this important seed to the Western world. And also they produce a lot of uh, urea for fertilizer. Oh, so, so it shows that uh, all this conflict can cause more resources to be utilized. And in Malaysia, uh, you have this uh, Batangkali uh, landslide tragedy, tra tragedy because of uh, instability of the soil. And you can see that all these uh, major disasters cause uh, loss of lives and families. And, okay, this is a very important slide. So I want to show you this uh, uh, picture of this earth. Just now I said uh, the land uh, mass is about 30%. But here I put down the land is 20%. The ocean is 80%. What is the representation of these two percentage? It's not the land size, land surface area, it's something else. Who, who knows what's the difference? What's the representation, representation here? 80% and 20%. Okay, so the 80% means that we always think that the oxygen that we breathe now produced from the trees. Uh, this one says that 80% of our oxygen come from the ocean. It's come from the phytoplankton. Uh, the reason why uh, there's life on the Earth now, because of the existence of phytoplankton. They process the carbon dioxide and change it to oxygen. That's why uh, some of these people, they want to um, uh, uh, migrate to all these planetary countries like Mars and all that. They were thinking to use uh, plankton uh, to produce more oxygen. So this is something that uh, Elon Musk uh, is doing. Uh, so they produce all these robots uh, that can work on Mars to, to set the infrastructure so that for humans to migrate if we continue to, dis to destroy it. So oxygen uh, mainly produced from the ocean. And carbon dioxide sink, majority come from the ocean. So that's why our ocean is getting more and more acidic. So the key gases carbon dioxide is, is sink into the ocean and the oxygen come from the, from the ocean. So if we continue to destroy the ocean, there will be less oxygen. So these are the, 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 the importance of this carbon dioxide. So the carbon dioxide will be absorbed by the sea and that will cause more acid and the kill the plankton will be less oxygen. And uh, the majority of the heat from the earth 
is absorbed by the sea. So the sea are getting warmer and it causes the ice cap to melt. So, so this problem of carbon dioxide and also methane causing warmer temperature causes the sea level to go up. Bleaching means the coral are dying because of too much acid, all the shells are dissolving. Toxic algae, also these are things that cannot produce oxygen. Habitats, acidification, and less fish for human consumption. And uh, these are the climate indicators. There are seven. Uh, in 2021, four out of seven climate indicators have recorded highest values ever. The highest temperature recorded in the uh, history of uh, last uh, few million years is July 2023, last year. Uh, so last year was very high temperature. So it shows that the ocean heat increased, acidification increased, uh, atmospheric carbon dioxide increased sea level. So just now I asked you to memorize this. At the moment, our carbon dioxide is 423. Uh, just now I said 400, and now it's 423. And the global temperature now is about 1.4 degrees compared to pre-industrial. Means about 200 years ago, uh, our temperature is about 1.4 degrees. So it's getting nearer and nearer. And 2030 is a year where we have to suffer. Methane also increased. The Arctic Sea uh, cap also receding. The ice sheet also receding. Ocean warming. Uh, the the Georgia sea level also increased. So how can we protect our environment? It must start from you uh, with the five hours. So it's not three hours, five hours. So I'm going to talk about what is a five hours. So it, sometimes you, because of uh, convenience, you just throw it. Uh, sometimes it will end up in the sea. And, and all these uh, uh, birds, they consume some of this uh, microplastic and also kill them. And, and the research sh uh, shows that there are two entry points to our human body. We swallow them or we breathe them in. And evidence is showing that our food and water is contaminated by microplastics. So you may say that I, I don't eat fish, so I don't get the microplastic. So what they do is that they catch all these fish, and the fish that has no economic value, they convert into fish meal. means that it's a food for other animals because they don't want to waste all these proteins. So these other animals also consume this microplastic from the fish meal and a lot of this fish are converted uh, to fish meal because of the protein and you may say uh, this is not important but in certain countries like in US they recommend that if you are pregnant you should not eat uh, one serving of fish uh, per week because of all this contamination mainly chemical contamination not so much of microplastic it's a chemical contamination so uh, sea creature has a lot of chemical contamination that will affect the fetus. So, and then uh, the other things that are toxic chemicals in plastics. So sometimes we attend conferences and uh, for convenience, we will drink from the mineral water. Actually, that is the worst uh, plastics that you can consume because a lot of them are in your mineral water. So never uh, drink from a mineral water uh, forever from now on because some of this plastic you link to hormone disruption, reproductive harm in baby boys. Uh, it's also linked to cancer. It's also linked to breast cancer and early puberty and infertility. So if you look or go to a hospital, some of these gynecology who uh, specialize in IVF, they have a very good business because they are very difficult to get pregnant now for the young people. So there's this study in US found that the majority of the microplastic that we eat or breathe in come from bottled water. Oh. This is what I mentioned earlier. Second, come from the beer. Okay, so some of you here who likes to drink beer, you have to be careful. You, uh, you may be like a uh, tool of plastics. And also it's a uh, five precepts, huh? so don't drink so much. Further down is air, tap water, seafood, and uh, all these things. Huh? And where does the ocean microplastic come from? First is synthetic textile, 35%. So if you wear a lot of clothing that's made from synthetic textile, like the one that I'm wearing now, sorry. <laughs> Car tires and city dust. All this will cause uh, microplastics. So, and then uh, it takes uh, 500 years to bi biodegrade degrade in the ocean. Secret bud, all these are not so important. We don't smoke plastic grocery bag. We also use less styrofoam cup, aluminum cans, plastic beverage holders take 400 years. But I want you to focus on disposable diaper. Okay, we are 
I cannot really, I'm no, not qualified to comment uh, because I use diaper all the time for my children. Because at the time, we don't really know that the uh, threat to environment. So if you have a choice, but not easy, try not to use a disposable diaper. It is so convenient now. And it's, you cannot go back to the old times where you use a cloth. You know, it's, it's very difficult, uh, but, but try to use less. So you should train your children at uh, one, one and a half years, you can train them not to wear diapers. So our children are trained uh, to, uh, not to wear diapers, and uh, it takes about one week to two weeks to train them. So after a few times where they, they urinate and pass motion, they will know that this is very uncomfortable. Uh, so 1.5 years, you can train them not to wear diapers. Okay, so a lot of you may say that, oh, I do recycling, oh, I contribute to the environment. But you must see that some of this plastic, uh, you look at the coding at the back, there's a one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Only one and two can be recycled, and, uh, and number five can be recycled. So what is one and two? Is all this uh, mineral water, and also the container that you put in your detergent. And uh, these are some of these uh, ice cream tops and all that. These are the only ones that you can recycle. The rest cannot recycle. You can send to recycling station, and they will throw away because it cannot be recycled. So not everything that you think can be recycled can be recycled. So I hope that you are curious of what I talk about and also convinced and committed to do your part. And uh, so you know this person called uh, President, uh, Vice President Al Gore. Any of you heard of him? Uh, only older people understand who is <laughs> young one, we don't know. So this guy, he was uh, running for president, but he didn't get, but he became the vice president. And he has been talking about global warming since 1989, which is about 30 years ago. And he's been talking many, in many, many uh, platforms, and uh, he is a very powerful person. And he also come up with a documentary, it's in YouTube, YouTube and it's uh, viral. So, a powerful guy with so much connection and uh, also social presence, and he has been shouting from the rooftops about global warming. How come nothing changed? So, such a powerful person, he's a vice president of uh, US, and also so connected and so powerful, how come there's no change? Because, because we, all of us need to do our part. It's not from these powerful people, you know. And it's not me, it's one, every one of you. So we are like the, the, we are like the little bees, you know. So you can see that the bees are collecting pollen, just minute amount. But they can come up with this honeycomb and honey. So it doesn't come from one bee, it has to be a collective effort. Or you may say that other people also don't do it, why, why do I need to do it? So if you are depending on other people to do it, and also the leaders to do it, uh, our world will, is uh, going towards the destruction. So what can you do? So first one, reduce uh, carbon footprint. Use public transportation. So I, I do drive cars, but today I walk here from my house. <laughs> and uh, there's one uh, environmentalist uh, called, a young lady called Thurman. She started in 12 years old, but uh, she always have a fiery talk to promote environment. But recently, she become not so popular. Uh, one thing is that when she traveled to all these conferences, they criticize her. They say, you, you also use a plane and use a train. You know, why are you talking about environment? You should walk here. <laughs> and, uh, but the main reason she's uh, not so popular now because she used a uh, non-compassionate way of, uh, of promoting environment. They use anger, you know. So anger is not good. Our three poison, uh, de uh, craving, anger, and delusion. So reduce your carbon footprint, save energy. So turn all your light bulbs to LED, conserve water. So even though our water is cheap compared to Singapore, try not to use so much uh, because it will cost uh, energy to produce, uh, to clean and filter the water. Practice uh, waste reduction, reduce, reuse, and recycle, but there's none to us, which I'm going to talk about. Minimize single-use plastic, opt for eco-friendly alternative, compost your organic waste, and uh, choose eco-friendly ethical product with certification like organic fair trade and all that. Promote renewable energy uh, and um, plant trees. Renewable energy like solar, water, and all that. Plant trees 
uh, absorb more carbon dioxide, educate and inspire so more people understand this and do their part and vote for the environment, choose political candidates or policies that prioritise environmental protection and sustainability and also participate in community initiative, join or organise local environment events, clean up recycling awareness campaign so that everyone is aware of this. So the five R's of consumption and waste, first is a reduce, try to use less. Uh, so before you buy anything, you, you, you think you can use it less. Or not. Reduce, repair and recycle. The bottom is recycle. The top two is refuse. This is most important. Before you produce anything, don't use it. You know. Refuse to so single-use plastic assessing packaging and don't buy if you don't need it uh, more than once a week. Second is rot. So rot means that the uh, organic waste. So the organic waste, as I said, if you send to landfill, it produces a lot of methane. But if you, if you compose it, it's good for the environment. So the trick is that if you send to the landfill, it's covered under all this pile of rubbish. So it's anaerobic, means that no oxygen composting. That will produce a lot of methane. So if you want to produce less methane, you compost it in the open space. So you, you get uh, eaten by all these all this, uh, microbes and don't produce methane. But you, you bury it under the ground, you produce uh, methane. So remember this, number one is refuse. The recycle is last, and most of the time cannot be recycled anyway. You, you think you are recycling, but actually not. So this is a slide about recycling, and it shows that out of these things that you send to recycling center, uh, it, majority of them uh, leak to the environment. Uh, no, these are the plastic. 40% uh. go to the landfill, 32% leak into the ocean and 14% sent to the incineration uh, uh, factory, and only 14% are used for recycling. Out of this 14%, uh, 8% are cascaded recycling. So, and then uh, 4% is process lots, and 2% are closed loop recycling. So what it means is that this is closed loop recycling means that it's uh, of a similar quality or higher quality plastic. So out of all this product, only 2% are recycling into proper use. Uh, so some, of the, some of the things that uh, certain NGO are doing, they only uh, use 2% of the plastic they have been used. So just now we talk about our action, but as I said, the, the main global warming uh, gas is uh, carbon dioxide and methane, methane number one, because of the power. Uh, so, so to cut down methane, it, it also uh, boils down to our food choices. If you, if you eat certain food, it will affect our environment. So you have to make the choice uh, three times a day, breakfast, lunch, and dinner. So you choose plant-based diet, it lower uh, greenhouse gas emission and uh, environmental impact, livestock farming, beef and lamb. These are the main methane producer. Local and seasonal food, so you eat something that's produced near to you. Organic foods, so they use uh, less pesticide and fertilizer. Reduce food waste, so only uh, consume or cook or buy the amount that you can consume fully. Water footprint, so use something that are less uh, water intensive. Eco-friendly packaging, so don't use all this plastic. Sustainable practices, supporting companies and producers that produce sustainable, environmentally uh, responsible practices. So some of these organic companies, their food is uh, maybe more expensive, but if you don't support them, uh, if you have the financial abilities, try to support them, even though they are more expensive, because if they don't do it, uh, no one else will do it. And I'm sure none of you will do all this organic uh, farm and all that. It's not, not easy. And then uh, the other one is uh, GMO consideration. These are things that are uh, a big topic that we can discuss uh, in future. So, I, I, some of you may understand what I'm trying to say, and they say, uh, can you guide or mentor me? So some of you may want to embark on this in a more aggressive way. So if you want, there's an organization that can guide or mentor you. So I'm a volunteer for Tsuji. Okay, so this organization, they, they practice what they preach. So some of these are uh, old, older people who, who has nothing else to do at home. So they volunteer at the recycling center. 
And uh, in uh, Bandar Utama, every month, they have a collection uh, center at the BU, is opposite um, the one Utama. So they collect some of these recycling things. But as I said, this is the bottom of the firehouse. And some of these older people, they find uh, a reason uh, rather than uh, wasting their time. They come to do recycling and also exercise and also meeting up with other people. So they have a social connection and also they are contributing to their own health and also the earth uh, well-being. So this is uh, some of my struggle. I was a meat eater and some of you say um, Buddha also meat, eat meat. But I, you can Google my name and I'm a whole food plant-based promoter. So I talk to people to eat a plant-based diet. But I myself eat meat. So <laughs> it's a conflict of uh, identity. And, and it's also a, a, a big struggle and guilt also because I want to stop eating but I have these cravings because since young, I eat meat. And I enjoy eating meat because haka, you know. So, so uh, a conflict, you know. I promote, I tell people not to eat. And in the, hospital, in the clinic also, I told them not to eat so much of this animal product. Not because of environment, because yeah, there are a lot of studies that prove that uh, this kind of diet is very bad for our health, especially cardiovascular problem, heart, stroke, and all that. So I promote it, but I myself not doing it. And then there are many reasons why people are not eating meat. Uh, some because of health. For me, I'm still healthy, but so I, not, not a reason for me. Uh. Environmental reason, also not really for me because I, I live in a very comfortable area, you know, in Malaysia, also not too bad. But the reason why I changed for the last two years is because of um, the universal needs of uh, other sentient beings for comfort, fear, happiness, and love. They are no different from you and me. So if you are true Buddhist, you think about the need of other sentient beings. Many of the animals here are the usual thing that you consume. All the cows, the sheep, the pig, and the chicken, and even fish. So you think fish are lower level, they are not mammals or not birds. They also have, uh, have this uh, uh, need for their love and also security. So for a good Buddhist, you try to eat less of this. So later, when you go for your lunch, uh, choose less meat <laughs> for environment and also for ethical reason. Okay, so this is the interconnectedness uh, between the different beings. So whatever we do, we have these uh, five hindrances. Anything in life, no matter you are a spiritual practitioner or going to work or going to change your, your life, like starting exercise or doing something, there are five things that stop you. First one is aversion. Okay? So in terms of food, you, are, you have uh, aversion to eating veggie. So some people say the whole life never eat veggie. <laughs> so these are your challenges. Second is sensory desire. So that's for me. You know, I like, like to eat all this uh, savory meat. Third is restlessness and worry. Maybe if I eat this food, it's unhealthy. So I can tell you that uh, this kind of food is healthy and also can reverse many diseases. The, the most important one is doubt. The doubt means that whatever Dr. Wong said today is all, I try to brainwash us, it's not true. So all this that I get, not that I'm an environmentalist, all these are in the, in the public domain. And, uh, and all this research by all these uh, scientists is not by me. So I'm just plucking from the internet. And the last one is a sloth and topo, means that you don't really care, you know, I just want to eat whatever that's convenient. So all of you have different, different challenges and you have to consider this. Let's say you want to exercise. You have the ill will of uh, aversion to, to start exercising. You have the desire to continue to sleep. And then uh, you, you also have this restlessness, uh, you want to play your computer game. And you also doubt exercise is good, man. Is it, does it help me, you know? and also laziness. So all this you have to find out from inside you uh, and also overcome it with your own uh, counter measure. So this is a, a, a young professor from NASA said that we have exceeded the tipping point, uh, the latest 
data says 1.5 degrees, the target is 1.5. But we have not reached, reached the point of no return, 1.5 degrees Celsius, only 0 0.1 degrees now. So nobody can go back and start a new beginning. This is a very uh, Buddha's teaching. You cannot change the past. But anyone can start today and make a new ending. So this is your karmic past. But this is your, your volitional action. Or in Chinese, they say that we are affected by our ye li, Karma, but our yen li means our aspiration to change we will change. So yearly you cannot change, but yearly you can change because it's our volitional action. You can read about this quantum physics and Buddhism consciousness. Uh, you talk, you, there's a double slit experiment by the quantum physicists and found that if if you just shoot the electron particles through the two holes, it will appear on the screen with two lines. But when we are not observing the, the, the particle being sent to the two slit, you can see many, many lines. But when humans observe it with their eyes, or even put a video camera on this uh, experiment, it becomes two lines. So this is very strange. The only variable here is our human mind. So when humans are not observing it, it has unlimited potential. But when humans are observing it, it becomes uh, solid. So our mind can actually change particles just by mind. Uh, it's not by any, any other uh, variable in this experiment. Our mind can affect all the different, different particles. So if you have an a unwholesome thought, uh, the, the surrounding, the people around you, or uh, the material around you, you change. And then, uh, yeah, this is uh, also come from this AI Nobu. It shows that uh, there's a similarity between the quantum physics and Buddhism. So Buddhism is a very scientific uh, religion. Uh, it shows that interconnectedness and also interdependence. So in, uh, in the quantum experiment, they say quantum entanglement means that if, if the atom are split, whenever, whatever you do here, you affect the atom anywhere else. So it's, it's, uh, it's not limited by space and time and also impermanence. So talk, Buddha talked about anicca. Quantum physics say that everything is in the flux. Keep moving this. There's an unlimited potential. But because of human observ observation, it collapses the potential into particle. So impermanence. Non-dualism non and, uh, and unity. So this is also the concept of uh, anatta, non-self. So this one you can read yourself. Huh? You go and ask the AI. And also mind and consciousness. Buddhism plays significant emphasis on the nature of mind, and this is the, the double slit experiment that I talk about. So, I want all of you to check with your whatever spiritual practice that you have. If your practice frees you from attachment in the real life, then you are already practicing it. If not, whatever you understand is just theory. So, free you from what attachment? Carnal attachment, which is sensory attachment to sensory pressure like sight, sound, taste, and tactile sensation, leading to more craving and more suffering because you are attached to it, leading to impermanence. Another attachment is existential attachment, fear of death. You continue to uh, you hold on to your self-perception. So it's a lot of time because of conflict with our family or, or friends or colleague because I, my, my idea is more important. So you keep holding to it, you cause more suffering. So both of these hinder enlightenment. So we can uh, meditate for six hours, but when you come out of it, you are still fighting with other people and fighting with your family, then your meditation is uh, useless. Uh, so, so we have to check whether you can... Uh, uh, not uh, clinging to this attachment. So, uh, just to talk about uh, why I'm involved in Tsuji. So, the Tsuji vision is a spirit of great love, uh, means purify human minds, safe and peaceful society. These are the three things. World free from disaster. These are the main things. So, from some of the uh, things that are done by Tsuji, they can um, overcome uh, the, the the duality of different races, different species. They protect species and also different races. And this is the only religion, uh, Buddhism religion, that can uh, um, touch uh, society from different religions. Uh, so, so like in Indonesia and Malaysia, 
and some of these uh, Muslim people who are helped by Tzuji, they, they, were, they were touched by the universal compassion. So this is a common love for all the spiritual practices. So this is uh, the atomic recycling. We are comprised from all these different elements. Uh, this is part of my, the things I put up on Facebook. And uh, our consciousness coming forth. When we die, we are go back to all these elements and we recycle back. So throughout millennium, millennium and billion of years and eons, all this dust from the universe, uh, our coming force, reintegrate them with the four elements into our rupa and also our citta. So we are all uh, interconnected. So if you are, you are not merely living on earth, you are an integral part of uh, earth's composition. So what do we do? In daily life, integrating these practices into family life, business, and also social interaction, you must practice mindfulness, awareness of all activities, and uh, have a maintain a clear, focused mind, making ethical choices in your personal and professional life, uh, and your livelihood should not harm others. These are the Eightfold Path. So if you are Buddhist, the Four Noble Truth, Eightfold Path, you should not harm others. Engaging in regular meditation to develop concentration and insight, speaking and acting with kindness and compassion towards others, continuous learning and understanding the teachings of Buddha to deepen uh, one's right view and intention. So all these are consistent uh, and we must take action. So this uh, final one, if all mankind were to disappear, the world would regenerate back to the rich state of equilibrium that existed 10,000 years ago. If insects were to vanish, the environment would collapse into chaos. So uh, the earth doesn't need us, we need earth. Okay, with that, I thank all of your attention. Thank you. We'd like to thank Dr. Wong for sharing the Dhamma with us today. Um, if I could just chip in something, um, that was very relevant to what I do as well because I'm a plant-based lifestyle advocate. I've been vegan for eight years, so no meat, no dairy, no eggs, no honey. Um, I'm 41 years old. I feel younger than I did in my 20s, and I'm an open water swimmer. Um, for the past three years, I've been getting top five placings in my age category, and I've really learned that the plant-based diet is so relevant to well-being, not just for people and living things around us, but for yourself as well. And if you do it properly on a whole foods plant-based diet, not only can you survive, but you can thrive on it. And I'm very grateful every single day for being a vegan. And it has really unleashed a whole world of potential and self-awareness and compassion that is not just extended to animals but to humans as well. So um, that is something I would like to uh, reinforce from Dr. Wong's speech that it's never too late. Um, there are people from all walks of life in the vegan community here and um, whatever your jalan is to, to walk the, the plant-based path, if you are willing to look for it, it is there. So thank you very much, Dr. Wong, for the very informational presentation. I learned so much from it. So we would like to open the floor for one question. Dr. Wong, uh, just out of curiosity, on a comparative note, would it be better to eat the, replace the real meat with artificial meat, man-made? Well, man-made meat may not be perfect, but perhaps the methane output may be far lower than the animal. Okay. While you still satisfy our craving for meat. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Uh, actually, it depends on where you're coming from. If, if your reason for eating is because of health. So she's an example of a person who, who thrives on this type of diet. And it has been proven uh, you can start at any time. And uh, last few days, I've been looking at uh, some uh, cardiologists in US. Those patients that they have given up with all the conventional medicine in ICU, you know, the, uh, all the medicine, you know, US is, uh, is the gold standard for treatment. Even they are set 70, 80 years old, they are going to die where they have no choice. What they do is that they give them a study, they give them a uh, plant-based diet in ICU but it's a raw vegan diet. And, and they can reverse their problem within 10 days. They can walk out from the ICU. 
So it depends on where you're coming from. So for you, I think you're like me, we like to eat all this good food. <laughs> and if you look at this meat, that of course if it's an artificial one, it's not so much of methane, but to become artificial, they put a lot of processed chemical to, to produce this, uh, this meat. But I want you to con uh, ponder, all this good food that you eat, uh, there's a lot of oil. So let's say you, you eat chicken or pork, uh, you, you boil it, is it nice or not? Not nice, right? So to be nice, it must have a lot of oil. So oil is a processed food, and then uh, and it's not good for health. So so depends on what what's the choice that you make. So so my patient, many of them like you, uh, they cannot be so strict on this diet, but they can choose to enjoy some of this good food like your bakute and all that, but eat a small piece instead of eat a big bowl. So, so that's my advice to my, to my patient. And, 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 and you can see that uh, this movement is uh, gaining momentum. You go to many of the restaurants, they already have menu uh, that, that, that serve to uh, this group of people that they want to eat uh, vegetarian food. And, and, and the argument that says that uh, the Theravada tradition, they eat anything that is given to you. But you must know that why Buddha have this tradition? It's because of compassion. Uh, so whatever you give, I, I want to allow you to create the blessing. So it's a Buddha's compassion to accept whatever that you give. But you have a choice uh, to have compassion to your body for health uh, and also for your spiritual practice. Okay, with that, thank you. Oh, thank you for answering that question, Dr. Wong, and thank you for that very important question. It's very helpful for everyone else, I'm sure.